packaging techniques. So typically, a, um, a packaging lab will have several types of equipment in it, and these will be the ones that, in the main, um, an integrated quantum chip will will be needing to use. So we'll need to get the light off the chip. Uh, to get the light off the chip, there's either going to be using a, some sort of bulk optics or a fiber packaging um, tool to get the fiber to it, to the chip. So you can see here in this lab, for example, our, at our lab at Tyndall National Institute, we've got um, multiple fiber packaging tools that are different for different kind of processes. But the concept here is that we need to think about as designers of our um, uh, quantum chip, that we need to get the light off it so that or onto it to be fair either uh, so on and off the chip we need to get that information on and off it could be optical uh, and in this case fiber packaging would be one of the things we need to be thinking about um, on the far right hand side here you can see there's a micro optic packaging because that's another technique for getting light on and off your chip um, so it could be micro optics or it could be fiber these are the two main uh, uh, routes for that other things we need to think about is um, how to make electrical contact with the chip. If I want to drive the chip or I want to control what's happening on it electrically, uh, this would now have some sort of wire bonding, uh, perhaps a flip chip um, technology needed. So these are some of the things and the machines that we need to think about when we're designing our chip that it needs to uh, be compatible with. Um, and that would save us a lot of, um, as designers, a lot of time and money and effort for our projects if we think about that in the start to make sure that our quantum chip is compatible with machines out there that can um, get the information on and off the chip for you. Uh, which is why we've also got a design packaging tool in the lab as well, is to remind people that one of the key things when designing uh, the chip is to keep packaging in mind from the very start that helps um optimize everything so typically you'd have a chip um in this case it could be a, pit, a, a photonic integrated circuit but it um it would need to think about the optics of coming in off like i'm saying so it could be multi-channel it could be a single channel and um, we need the electrics coming on on and off is that's going to be on a is it going to be a standalone chip in a lab um are you going to have i mean are you going to have a PCB that you're going to put your chip onto? How are you going to communicate between the chip and the PCB? A, what kind of um, technology needs to connect the two? Is it a, a standard kind of uh, DC uh, current or is it a, uh, are you needing a high speed technology going on? So these are some of the things that um, we think about when we're designing our chips early on. What type of packaging does it need? Because it will need to be handled. It will need to be flipped upside down, turned around, uh, things kind of, uh, instead of putting probes down in the lab, which um, is possible, sometimes it's much cleaner and safer for the chip to have um, uh, kind of lab assembly technology used for it. Um, are you kind of wanting laser source on it? Uh, Dave mentioned that in Cornerstone, they're currently working on introducing this, uh, I think in the, in the Glasgow um, lab. And this is say, so this is something that, um, whether it's integrated at wafer level, but it could also be a hybrid integration later on. So these are some of the questions um, in a packaging concept, we tend to try and think about and encourage you as designers and users uh, and innovators to kind of keep in your mind while you're uh, looking at the function of your chip, the performance of it, what you want from it, that this packaging kind of questions need to be in mind. Is there a thermal um, criteria for the chip as well? And I'll touch on these a bit more now so it kind of helps, um, helps kind of bring things into, uh, kind of into the spotlight for people. So, I mean, there are, um, like we're saying, there's optical criteria to consider, there's electrical, uh, and mainly thermal. These would be the three key that we need to think about and I'll, and I'll mention here, uh, but also there is uh, mechanical as well. So I've kind of given just here a kind of crude example to give you a feel where you have a chip and it's got some bulk optics around it. Has it got fibers coming into it? Um, are there a electrical uh, connections? Are these electrical connections in the form of uh, wire bones or are they in the form of... Um, 
uh, solder jetting and uh, the chip is flipped uh, to, to make direct contact uh, through a bond pad. Um, there's also these thermal implications. Is there, do you need your quantum chip to be um, cooled so that it's at an optimum temperature so that the performance um, of, the, uh, of the chip is at optimum? Uh, this is typically a criteria that um, we would be seeing again and again that people sometimes forget about. They need to keep their chip cooled. They need to keep it at a certain temperature to get the best performance out of it because every photon counts in, in many of these applications. Um, and then the housing uh, sometimes can be overlooked, but that will have implicated the housing and the mechanical um, uh, criteria of a chip can, impl can impact the thermal or electrical uh, performance and sometimes the optics as well. Um, so there's things that there that we encourage people to think about early on in the design. So kind of just to give you a, a feel, now we have dedicated training um, and some of them are full days or three days and there's hands-on training as well to look at each of these uh, in much more detail. This is just a kind of a taster to get you a feel of what kind of things you need to think about when you're designing your uh, or even using your um, uh, quantum chip. So for example in the photonic, uh, sorry in the optic side of it, you're, you want to think about what type of fiber am I using? There are different types of fibers out there. I've just put on here the main three that are used. There are many more, but the main three concepts are that we see used again and again, uh, and we expect them to be used also. And uh, we're seeing them already kind of being used in the quantum applications, you know, single mode fiber, where it's using a total internal reflection, uh, but also you may have multi-mode fiber where it has multiple from the names of it, modes propagating in there, typically for short to reach applications. So um, it could be um, in, in the same building or something, whereas the single mode would be for far distances. Uh, it's much more optimized for that. And then there's a quite a popular one as well, which is polarization maintaining. It's a type of single mode, uh, but it's got st stressed rods in there that uh, keep whatever polarization it receives, it maintains. Um, so if that's sensitive for your application, then uh, this would be quite good for it as well. So these are some of the things that we'd be thinking about. Uh, and then how do we connect these to the chip? And that's in itself um, a, a dedicated training session where we look at how do we optimize our the edge of our chip to connect to the fiber. Uh, and these are typically through certain types of grating couplers or edge couplers. Uh, and we have several talks of these on our Europractice YouTube channel where Francesco talks about them in detail. Um, but also we do kind of um, uh, training sessions throughout the year as well. So one of the other things here we, we'll be looking at as well, just kind of as an overview as well, here is the talked about the electrical, with this electrical side. How are you connected to your chip? How are you controlling it? Uh, do you need to, uh, is it just light or is there um, electrical uh, kind of criteria there as well? So are you using RF signals and you need um, dedicated RF wire bonds? These need special tools. They have special criteria. Typically the, the bond is very short. Uh, it's got a special shape to it to try and maximize uh, the bandwidth in it and the speed. Um, whereas uh, if it's just say, maybe you just want an electrical uh, bond that's just to control the chip and it's not got any uh, speed criteria, then DC bonds, they also have their criteria, but you can see here in the bottom image, the wire bonds are much longer than the top image. Um, they can get away with much more. However, typically you can find these can get quite messy uh, because there's a lot of bonds in there and then it can um, then start to cause problems for the designer because they're not getting what they expected. Uh, so these are kind of some of the things that we typically um, look at here. And uh, the other one, like I was mentioning here, is thermal. Um, so what I want here for the thermal really is to kind of just remind you as designers that maybe one of the problems you're seeing in the lab um, when you've got your probe done on your device and it's not giving you the, the performance you're expecting. It's just a little bit out. That could quite well be due to the uh, temperature. 
Um, so that's a good thing to do like a first check on is, is there a temperature implication for your design? And um, sometimes this can be solved with just kind of um, reducing the temperature in the lab. But if you're now kind of using and you're, it's kind of a chip that has an assembly, um, then there may be other components, not your chip itself, that's producing the heat and is um, affecting the performance of your, uh, of your device. And in this case, uh, typically we would have um, Peltier's or Tex in there to just bring down that temperature or control the temperature just to keep it at a fixed range. Um, so that's something that's quite important to be thinking about. And again, um, there are, this is kind of like a taster uh, training tutorial session where we go through a few things here just to give you the idea of what you need to be thinking about as innovators. Uh, but also these have, uh, we do provide dedicated training in these um, just because they need the space and the time for it uh, through the, uh, through whether it's hands-on or online or, um, but yeah. Uh, that kind of gives you a feel of what you need to be thinking about as well. But you make it a bit easier because already you can tell there's quite a lot of things that are not in one expertise domain. They cover quite a lot of domains already. And each one, it's a, it's a school in itself. So what um, we've done is created a, uh, a manual a, uh, where you can open it up, look up and follow design rules uh, for your optics, for your uh, electronics, for your electrical, um, RF, kind of just thinking about all these different things. Are there zones that you need to keep out of so your electrical and your optics are not um, affecting each other? One assembly technique may um, block the other from being done. So you can see here on the right-hand side, it's, it's crude, but it's um, really effective in helping people understand that some things here just don't work. Um, and because it may be that it affects your, your fiber affects your bomb pads and then your bomb pads don't work um, or your um, bomb pads are too intertwined and that affects how they're connected and they can no longer uh, get uh, wire bonded. So this and this is just um, a lot of what we try to do here is um, uh, kind of open access. Um, it's one of the things that also that um, Dave mentioned here as well. Uh, so this is available online. You can download this uh, manual, look through it, and it can, you can start looking at your own design and think about, well, what works, what doesn't work. And there's some best practices here that we can follow, uh, but also getting in touch with us works as well. Uh, this is uh, this is to enable you so you, you can look at it yourself and um, compare it with your design as well. So that gives